Hi, welcome to Outthink. I'm Lawrence Akers. I'm a clinical hypnotherapist, member of the LGBT community, and a passionate advocate for mental health. These podcasts have been made in hope of sharing insight into issues that impact on the LGBT community. So they were talking with Matthew Cooksey, and we're chatting about The Velvet Rage, which is a book that describes the journey many gay men take from being in the closet to finding true authenticity. Matthew coaches people to create an authentic life, and he's my guest today on the topic as he runs study groups on The Velvet Rage. Matthew, thanks for joining us today. Good afternoon, Lawrence. Nice to be here. Now, The Velvet Rage is a text that um, we're both very passionate about. Mm. I know that for many clients that come and see me, I often recommend and refer that book quite yeah. a lot. What do you think it is about this book that connects so strongly mm. with you personally? Well, I guess I, I want to reflect on two things. One is I read it first probably about seven or eight years ago. Um, Attitude magazine featured it um, in one of their editions. And, you know, my reaction seven or eight years ago was actually quite different to uh, how I reacted to it when I read it in the last couple of years. And I just think it's worth mentioning that point because when I read it seven years ago, there was a instant recognition no question about the world and the journey that Alan Downs was describing in my own life. You know, I could see elements of shame presenting in my life, which is one of the core concepts of the book. And I could see some of the impacts of shame as far as uh, how that was affecting who I was being, you know, when I was out in a club or whatever, you know, I could see a lot of what he was describing. And at the same time, I really felt a resistance to the book too. I felt like, who's this guy telling me the way I am and he doesn't know anything. And there was actually, ironically, given that he is saying and talking about rage, rage itself. Yeah. there I was raging in my response to parts of what he, uh, he raises in the book. And so it was interesting to note that, uh, not so much at the time, but more retrospectively. And so in the last couple of years, um, you know, I've done a lot of personal work, uh, through training to, to become a psychotherapist and, and coach. And, um, and now I coach other people through the velvet rage, I run these groups. And what's been fascinating has been to reread the velvet rage, having done all of that and to notice a very different reaction to the book, one of much greater recognition of the rage that I previously was experiencing mm -hmm. that I was actually denying at the time in lots of ways. So I think, you know, it's a book that uh, does stir people's responses quite strongly and, um, and good, to be honest, because either way, whether you disagree or agree, it's going to really cause you to stop and think. And mm -hmm. I think that's only, that's only good. It does revolve around two kind of key issues being about shame and acceptance. Mm -hmm. And I tend to find that they're two topics that can be widely misunderstood mm. uh, by people in general. Perhaps tell us a little bit about your understanding of, of what is shame and, and yeah. what is this authenticity? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. There's a cool distinction that uh, Brene Brown puts forward between guilt and shame. And she talks about how guilt ultimately is quite an adaptive thing. Guilt is what has us say, you know what? I could have done that better. Or actually, I, I would like to meet my commitments to people in the future. And today I, I didn't do that. And so guilt is the healthy response that that is slightly uncomfortable that tells us that we're out of alignment with our values or yeah. commitment and so on. She talks about shame though, being something altogether less adaptive, something that has this terrible harshness to it that says that because of what's happened, you're a fundamentally flawed, bad human being. And shame I, I've found can be lurking in the most interesting and subtle places. So I think one of the important things I want people to really hear in this is that you don't have to be walking around absolutely castigating yourself mm. to be someone who is experiencing shame. Shame can be in a so much more subtle situation just uh, under the underneath the surface lurking there so i think it's important if you're reading the velvet rage to to really slow down with your concept of shame 
whatever connotation that has for you, because many of us, me included, react to that by saying, I don't feel shame. I don't have shame going on, you know, and, and what I've found is that shame is often lurking somewhere in quite innocuous parts. Like as an example, maybe you've got a whole, you're sitting down on a Monday morning and you've got a whole lot of stuff to get done this week, personal and work wise. And maybe you have the thought, um, you know, I really should have done this last week. Uh, I should be further ahead. You know, is there, is there shame in that? I, mm. I don't know if anyone would necessarily identify that as shame. Being shame, exactly. And yet underneath it, if you really slow down, I should have, I should have done this last week. There's something, something slightly, uh, sinister in that, that, that basically is that tone of you're bad. Mm. You've failed. You did wrong. And depending on the degree to which you experience that, um, you may discover that there's an element of shame in that. And of course, anything, any, anything that you do in your work or personal life that is motivated by shame fundamentally is kind of problematic from the start because there's uh, there's this underlying element of, of fear and anxiety that's driving your decision making. Mm. And we know that anytime someone's making a decision out of a feeling of not being good enough, that generally it won't have the sorts of consequences that they would like. So, so I think for me, that's the, that's the thing with shame is it's so much more subtle and, um, harder to pick out than you might think. You don't have to be th thoroughly drowning in shame to find shame's fingerprints in your, in your life. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then you were asking about acceptance. Yeah, um, authenticity, authenticity. Guess, more towards that because that's the other yeah. area. There is a belief that we are aiming to move towards being an authentic yeah. self. And again, I tend to find that a lot of people sometimes struggle with understanding what that is. Yeah. You know, they might believe that you come out and you accept that you're gay and, and that's being authentic. Yeah. Whereas there's actually a, a far deeper layer that goes beyond that. Yeah. It, this topic I could talk about for, for hours, uh, authenticity, because, um, you know, it's when I first read the book, I had that exact same reaction. I thought, Oh, well, I think I'm, I'm authentic. I, I said this with a slightly smug expression on my face. Oh, great. I'm in, in the book, he talks about three stages and I sort of notionally put myself in stage three and, uh, and felt pretty good about it. And a lot of that was to do with, you know, I've now come out and I'm living my life and, you know, all of these clothes that I never really wanted to wear that were so straight and hiding myself away. I'm not wearing anymore. And I'm now sort of expressing myself properly. So I'm authentic. Great. And, you know, on a level that's true, you know, there's a level of authenticity there, which is great and not to be, not to be, um, sniffed at. Um, and at the same time, what I've come to see is that authenticity is about something so much deeper than, than any of that, because I mean, without wanting to get too philosophical for your poor, um, listeners today, um, it really goes to some of the the core questions of what it is to be a human being, because, mm -hmm. you know, we, uh, we grow up from such a young early age, you know, with these ideas about who we are, you know, my name is Matthew. One of the, that's one of the first things I learn about myself. Um, I learn that I'm a good boy when I do certain things and I learn I'm a bad boy when I do other things. And depending on my parents, that will have a, very have an impact significant there. impact yeah. on the kind of person I think I am. And, and of course my genetics will affect my sense of who I am as well, because I'll be more predisposed to some things. Maybe I'm more pre predisposed to be anxious. Uh, maybe I'm less predisposed to be anxious, you know, so that, that genetic piece will all affect it. But over time, what happens is as an adult, I start to form this story of who I am you know, this story about me, I'm, I'm overly sensitive or I'm like a bull in a China shop or I'm, I'm, I'm kind or I'm successful or I'm a failure or I'm a, you know, these become who we are. Hmm. And the journey towards authenticity is both incredibly 
empowering and also incredibly confusing for the reason that it is about discovering that this notion of who you are, your story of who you are is a fraction of the truth yeah. of who you are. And that in fact, as esoteric as this might sound as la la, as this might sound on some levels, there is a, such a thing as a higher self mm -hmm. as a, as a soul, if you want to call it that, um, or at the very least for the science buffs out there, um, a higher part of our brain, yeah. right? However you want to look at that, it doesn't really matter. And that, that, that part of us carries so much more wisdom and, uh, insight for us so that we can go through life so much more powerfully and so much more securely as compared to when we're referring to a self that is small and judgmental and frightened and operates on a win lose kind of mentality, um, which is where most of us, uh, are really coming from most of the time. Mm. Um, and for me, I'm 37 now and I spent the majority of those 37 years coming from a very small part of myself and have come to see that there's so much more to me. And yet at the same time, I'm not that special in the sense that there's so much more to all of us. And that is it, in fact, what actually uh, unifies us. If we look at the book I mentioned before, there, there are three stages that he really talks about there. Um, and that initial stage of, of being in the closet. Yeah. Uh, and I guess this is also, this really starts from our childhood where a lot of these um, shame messages yeah. actually are formed and, and reinforced through, you know, a multitude of possible examples. Um, I'll share with our listeners my personal one, one of the personal ones I have. I have a, um, I'm not good enough. Mm. And when I sat down and actually went back to find where that came from, I recalled an instance where my parents had decided that they were going to go to Hobart to celebrate their anniversary and they weren't going to take me. They were going to leave me at home with my siblings. As a child, I had a, why am I not going? Why am I not important enough? Why am I not good enough? And that was kind of the, the I think the genesis of that, mm. but listening to it now, it's absolutely absurd. Hmm absolutely ridiculous but when you're a child and you think that and then you start to like we do with beliefs go to look for reinforcement of that it becomes this replayed message over and over again reinforced i think also for a lot of uh the lgbt community we recognize at a very early age that we are different from the other boys and girls and I don't think we can ever exactly put our finger exactly on what it is at the time, but we recognize that there is a difference. Yeah. And worst of all, the other kids recognize there's a difference too. And in many ways, I think we have a, a, a quite a unique experience with shame in the sense that we are inevitably touched by it just from that feeling of being different. Yeah. I couldn't agree more with you. Um, I remember an incident when I was at school, um, and I must've been about seven or something like that. And I remember looking over at the boys all playing football and, and stuff, and it all looked very, uh, physical and I felt intimidated by it. And I looked over to the right on the playground and the girls were playing skipping and that looked far more interesting to me. And, you know, this is, uh, this is not something that, um, in many ways should be a big deal. But of course, when I went up to the girls to ask if I could play skipping quite innocently, um, they said, no, because you're a boy. Mm. So immediately there's a sense of, oh, that's weird. And so not to be uh, discouraged, I decided to get creative and put my hand in my pocket and pulled out some lunch money. And so I went up and tried to bribe them to let me play skipping. And uh, these girls, bless them, not only didn't let me play skipping, but dobbed on me to the principal. So I end up in the principal's <laughs> office. And as much as this kind of like, we can laugh about this and I, yeah. and I really do. Okay. I, I think it's quite hilarious in lots of ways. As a seven year old, I remember sitting on the chair in the principal's office. My mum was called in from work 
Can you imagine that when you're seven to come and discuss my crimes against skipping? You know, this very serious crime that was skip gate. That's right. That was being discussed in these very sort of hushed tones between the principal and my mum. You know, there's a very real sense as I sat there in that chair that there is something seriously wrong with me. Wrong, yeah. There's something wrong with me. I don't know what it is. And, and of course, was I was I consciously sitting there thinking, seven years old, there's something wrong with me? Not consciously at all. But underneath, I think this is what so many LGBTI people have mis uh, have have underestimated is the potential of those seemingly not all that bad experiences. Because mm. in the scheme of what I've heard from other LGBTI people, that really wasn't that big a deal. Mm. But in my life, to the sense of me that went on to not feel like I'm enough, that was huge. It's perception is reality. It it doesn't matter in in the sense of being competitive with other people about how uh, traumatic (laughs) the experience is. It just simply comes down to what event in our lives, as much as we can look back and and laugh on them now or be able to rationalize the experience, as a child caused that shame trauma to begin and that message to form and then the subsequent replaying of it over and over so that it went from being an experience to being a belief yeah um and that's really i think you know where, why people misunderstand shame is that yeah. they think shame is in fact i think very few people probably could define shame in a mm. way that is mm. meaningful yeah you know, popular culture seeing yeah shame on you if you can't dance too which you know, <laughs> in the lgbt world let's face it it's possibly a crime but <laughs> The reality is, is that I think people have a, a very um, disjointed relationship with what shame is as well as yeah. with shame itself. I think it's because people just minimize the experiences like the one I went through. Mm. You know, I just I just used to look back on that and go, well, that's just not a big deal. Yeah. Not, not a big deal. And in many ways it wasn't, but in many ways it absolutely was. And as you say, you tie that together with a whole bunch of other things that took place. Um, you know, I can remember... Um, my teenage crush coming on holiday with my family and, uh, you know, being absolutely so in love with this guy. His name was Gareth and he was gorgeous and I wanted him so much. And yet the feeling of wanting him and wanting him sexually as well and, and knowing because society had told me that such, uh, such attraction was so deeply wrong. I mean, again, at the end of the day, years later, I got over it and I have had very happy functional relationships since then. So it'd be very easy to look back on Gareth and say, no big deal. You know, everyone goes through that and that's just the way it is. But seeds are sown in those times. You know, it was not a benign experience for any of us. And I would argue in a way that it would almost be impossible for any LGBTI person to grow up and not develop some level of shame related to sexuality or gender identity yeah. um, because of the deeply, deeply homophobic society that we've all been growing up in. I mean, even 40% of new graduates going into new companies in this day and age, in 2017, 40% are going to go back in the closet as they go to work. Mm-hmm. I mean, so if we think this is all done and dusted, um, we need to think again. Oh, it's fine. I was chatting to a, a friend uh, the other night on the phone. Her son uh, has come out and we're talking about my own experience there. And I, I reminded her, it's like every time you start a new job, every time you be put into a, a new social situation, you effectively need to come out again. Yeah. It's not something yeah. you do once and that's it. You may do it once personally, yeah. But we are required to do it over and over in our lives as we go into new groups of people or new mm. environments and situations. Um, and then, of course, when we have this, getting you know, back to this idea of shame, you know, some people can deal with it in a healthy way and, and you know, that's where guilt comes into it. And, but then other people can tend to find that it can turn into something uh, not so healthy and that's mm-hmm. where we have things like um, people-pleasing, where we have... Uh, rage and anger, where we have a whole uh, addiction is another one yeah. that comes up. Yeah. And of course, the, the creation, what they call the creation of the false self, where it's the version of you that you think other people expect. You know, from your own experience, you know, did you find that you had any of those kind of shame manifestations oh, going yeah. on? Yeah, big time. You know, I didn't come out until I was 25. I got a girlfriend. I was with her for five years. We bought a house together. I got the job that I thought my parents 
would love me to have. Um, I drove the car that would impress them. Um, you know, so uh, there were so many ways in which I was expressing or in w ways in which that shame was totally running my life. And that's the phase one of the velvet rage is really where you are swimming in shame and you don't even know it. You don't even know it. And for all of us, it has these different kind of hallmarks. And, and one of the big ones is remaining in the closet, but there are still people who, um, may have come out who are still swim, absolutely swimming in shame. Um, you know, some of the things I've heard people have been through, you know, it's hardly surprising, you know, I have a friend who, uh, was, um, was abused as a very young baby, physically abused. I uh, was then given up for adoption. Uh, and then, uh, many years later in his teens, when he came out was, um, was, uh, abandoned and told he had to leave. Um, you know, so this person has been, this person has been abandoned by two sets of parents, not just one, but two, you know, how much shame can some, can one person handle? And yet this person is just so beautiful and has, is, I can see finding his way through it and it's not easy. And yet I think his experience and both of ours as well speaks to the fact that, you know, anyone can find their way through it, but it's not an easy phase mm. to be stuck in shame. In the second part of the, the Velvet Rage, he talks about, you know, you've come out. And I think for a lot of people, they assume that coming out is that hitting authenticity. Yeah. And uh, in Alan Downs, who's the author of the Velvet Rage's uh, response to that is that we, we don't actually reach authenticity there. In fact, we almost go in this quest of the, the bigger, the better, the best. Mm. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Mm. Well, I think the second stage in the Velvet Rage is, is all about a life created by the avoidance of shame. So by this stage, you have come to see that shame is a very painful emotion to experience. And you've come to see that it has a very detrimental impact on your life. And by this stage, you've decided that you've done enough of all the shame. And oftentimes it has been that crescendo, that peak of the pressure of feeling shame that has led you to come out because you just can't take it anymore and and fuck it you know like and all the consequences if my parents uh kick me out then so be it so as you say people often think that then that's the birth of authenticity but what's really often happening for people is they're making a, dis a very conscious decision at that point that says never again am i going to put myself in circumstances where I can feel or be made to feel that terrible. And so I'm going to do whatever it takes to avoid these feelings of shame. Mm. So if I need to, um, if I need to, uh, get down to the gym five days a week and become completely obsessed about my diet, then I'll do it because that way, when I walk into circuit or a gay bar or whatever, I'm not going to risk a feeling of being judged and therefore a feeling of shame because I'm going to look incredible. And so that's one manifestation of mm. it. Maybe, uh, maybe you go in a completely di different direction. Maybe for you, uh, you've never felt successful or you've never felt like you've achieved something. And so sometimes somebody goes into this complete workaholism mm. and, and the way I will avoid feeling not good enough or feeling ashamed is by working every hour in the day, being completely obsessed about, um, my performance at work. God forbid anyone criticize me or give me some constructive feedback. Um, because I am desperately trying to avoid this feeling of shame. I've learned that shame is gross and disgusting and murky and terrible, and I'll do anything I can to avoid it. And the, the funny thing about all of those things, or those two examples I've mentioned is that they look perfectly legitimate mm. in our society. Having a good body, that's a good thing, right? Yes. Having, being committed to your work, great thing, right? Great work ethics, yeah. And so there's nothing wrong with any of mm. those things. It's really about why you want them yeah. in the first place. That is the nub of the issue. If you want them because you can't bear the feeling of shame, the very thing you're pursuing is going to 
cause you more suffering in the long run because it's not coming from, you heard it, your authentic self. It's coming from a version of yourself who you need to be or you think you need to be in order to avoid feeling shame. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and certainly as we reach that third section of the book there, you know, Alan talks in there about a guy who uh, I think he worked for a very successful company earning a massive amount of money, uh, working endless hours, thought that was the life he lead, uh, but then ended up going and opening up a cafe in the country, mm-hmm. cooking meals in a small town and found that that was far more rewarding, fulfilling and meaningful for him than the expectation of this big best life. And and that was, I think, one of the really beautiful examples in the book about finding authenticity, finding things that give your life meaning and value. Um, But perhaps you you want to comment a little bit more about that third Mm. section. Well, I think there's a really key transition to help people go from that second phase to the third. And that is uh, waking up to actually see that you are that in some way you are actually living your life in ways that allow you to defend yourself from experiencing shame. And that can be really hard for someone to to see who wants, to, who wants to see that shame is still indirectly impacting their lives, having already having had to face it before. Um, so it's a, the, the move from stage two to three has to be so gentle and so slow and careful, which is why I run these study groups because, um, they just allow people to start exploring what, um, what might be going on in their lives that they thought they might have dealt with already. Um, and for them to slowly start to see it. And I had one client who I was working through this with and when he said when he read in the book in that second stage that there was a possibility that shame might still be running his life he threw the book across the room literally because he was so so angry about the idea that shame might still be involved in his life and it's an interest in the reaction you had was one of rage well right and you know that was not lost on my client <laughs> yeah. right he's a smart smart guy and uh and so what he came to see was that nonetheless, even if he didn't want to acknowledge it, um, this avoidance of shame was still affecting him. And that is really the beginning stage in stage three yeah. is actually the, it's the big, be- the beginning of the end of stage two is the, is the beginning of stage three. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think as people sort of start to recognize this, th- it leads you then to this um, equally challenging phase, which I had previously thought I had reached and, and yet actually I can see in retrospect, I, I had not. And that is starting to understand really who you really are on the inside. If you're not, if I'm not Matthew Cooksey and I'm, if I'm not 37 and I'm not, you know, all of the other labels that I put on myself, then who the hell am I? And from that, you know, what do I want to create in the world? And this is a period of great ambiguity, Mm -hmm. uh, great uh, uncertainty for people, you know. Possibly confusion and overwhelm as well. Absolutely. Who am I? What am I trying to do in the world? Mm -hmm. Um, Questioning. Why why do I find myself in Wet and Wellington, uh, you know, three nights a week? Why, um, Why am I going out and getting drunk every weekend which is not to say there's any judgment from me you might well find me getting drunk next weekend but you know the question is why why are we doing all this stuff and so there's this questioning then about how i am and also who i want to to be who i who i really am and and so alan in the book talks about this concept called foreclosure on ambiguity and it's a really key concept in the stage three is that for somebody who wants to move in this direction of authenticity, they have to really build their um, tolerance for not having it all figured out yet. Mm. And, and to be willing to sit in that for months, if not even years to actually allow this whole, he sort of uses the metaphor as of those snowstorm things that you shape the snow globes, the yeah. snow globe. Um, and, and it's sort of allowing the pieces of snow to kind of settle over time. And, and he sort of highlights that if, if you ever find yourself making a really radical change, 
then you can generally click count on that being an, an example of foreclosure on ambiguity because in the jump to try and change everything often what's happening is you're just trying to get everything locked down now so that you know who you are where you're going what you're doing all that kind of stuff and as tempting as that is and as much as we do want to think that that's possible in my experience most people figure out this stuff over a longer period of time than that so building that tolerance for ambiguity is one of the main reasons i get these groups together and i don't charge people for these groups at all because i just recognize that that time that moment when somebody is recognizing the presence of shame in their life is wanting to figure out who they are it is so tender and and uh, is a vulnerability thing, yeah definitely. it really is and it, and it's just a moment where i mean imagine you planted a seed in a flower bed you know you have to do a lot to nurture that seed to get to a point where it becomes a bit more hardy and a bit mm. more secure and this is exactly the same when we're venturing off into a new world and figuring out who we are and all that stuff we've got to nurture people and so that's um that's why i do that because um i know how hard that is to not just chuck it all away and get back to what is well known mm. um, and works or is familiar on a level and um yeah it's a beautiful thing to watch this flourishing in people because uh well it, it just is it's beautiful to see for me it's a you know that it's the there's got to be something there better than this kind of question yeah, that comes up totally where you know they, they could be very successful in their job but feel completely empty and hollow from it and, and ask the question you know is there something better than this or they could be finding that life is just not turning out the way they wanted yeah. and almost asking in desperation there has to be something better than this and i think in those moments they begin to realize that what they're living what they're existing is not real it's not authentic yeah, yeah i think that's a, such a great point because um you know in the book he talks a lot about uh, the difference between the sort of satisfaction we get when someone praises us or we get something extrinsic on the outside we might get a pay rise we might get a promotion we might get a new car we might get a nice comment from our partner whatever that's all praise from the outside and probably one of the other key hallmarks of authenticity is learning to develop a connection to what he calls intrinsic sources of um, validation and self-worth so you know for instance um you know for me running uh running a velvet rage group for example is something i can look at and say you know that is my way of making a genuine contribution to this community mm. and in showing up for that and doing that i i don't need anyone else to tell me i'm a good boy or i did something nice for anyone because i just feel that i feel the gift of giving that to people and that's enough um for me to to experience that so i think developing uh a, a sense of why you're doing what you're doing is the point you know that you're coming to and i see this all over the place in the most successful people like i'm running a, a coaching program for some leaders at a accountancy firm one of the big ones and one of the big things that is coming up for so many of them is i'm succeeding i'm reaching these highest of highs but why for what you know there's only many, only so many new kitchens great holidays and so on i can go on at some point it is an absolute given of being a human being that you are going to start to hit upon the question of why am i doing all of this and unless you can answer that on some level then you can expect to experience some pain it, it, i know we were speaking earlier and you mentioned that about 60 percent of your clients are lgbt uh and i think it's important to note that shame is something that um affects almost everyone out there in fact i think uh psychologically the only people that um shame doesn't have an impact on are, are, are generally sociopaths and psychopaths and mm -hmm. i think most people are, are quite happy to say that they are shameful over admitting that they're a sociopath or a psychopath mm -hmm. um but with the clients that you do see coming in for shame what kind of issues do you see coming up that that you use the velvet rage as a, a template to help work through yeah 
I think most commonly for me in the work I do is uh, people who are in that sort of second stage who may not realize that they're in that second stage, but who are usually hitting upon some crisis of, um, of meaning, some crisis of like exactly what we were just talking about. Why am I here? Why am I doing all of this? And they usually come to me because uh, they're unhappy at work or they're unfulfilled in their relationship um, in some way. And they're really questioning what they're doing and they usually come wanting to just figure out a new thing. You know, I need to change careers or mm. I need to find a new job or I need to find a new partner or whatever. And that's usually the sort of external um, thing that shows up at the beginning of the work I, I do. I know um, in your work, um, you, you're working with a lot of people around addictions and yeah, addiction, anxiety, stress, uh, and again, yeah. these uh, addiction is a classic uh, experiential avoidance of, of yeah. dealing with shame. It's, yeah. you know, that feeling that um, human needs are not being met, that you're flawed or unlovable, that you can't get those needs met, that you are turning to something to give you a short term kick of happiness instead of dealing with yeah. the underlying issue. Yeah. So I see that less so in my practice uh, because usually people who are coming to me have have reached the point where they are seeing the shame almost for what it is and uh they're really at the point of wanting to kind of go beyond it to something else um so as i say usually it looks like people with career challenges wanting to change careers whatever or relationships and they're wanting to do that big jump mm -hmm. you know they're wanting to make the big leap and so you know a classic client i had i just concluded six months of coaching with and the brief at the start was, um, I, although I'm successful in my job, I'm so over it. Your job coach is to help me get a new job, get a new career. I want to do something different by the end of this six months. I want to be in, in that new thing. And the most amazing six months has just happened. We've, we've worked through the velvet rage and a whole load of other stuff. And, um, what has really transpired for this person is that number one, he's fallen back in love with his job, um, which is amazing. Um, and number two, he's also identified a whole different, um, part of himself, um, that wants to pursue a career in the arts. And this person is a really remarkable, incredible guy. And, uh, he uh, just got accepted into a very, very prestigious program, um, with one of Australia's top, uh, performing arts, um, uh, education establishments without naming them. Um, and, uh, and is now studying performing arts, uh, on a part-time basis whilst this person does, uh, continue in the job that they are flourishing in now. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, this person is not doing the big jump that Alan Downs warns about as mm -hmm. foreclosure against ambiguity. Um, and has learned to the reason he's been able to fall back in love with his work is he's, he's come to see how shame was making him or his attempt to avoid shame was having him turn his own job into a nightmare. Mm. You know, if, if you're desperately trying to avoid shame, you know, and, and you're a leader in an organization, well, one of the things that you do to avoid shame is avoid conflict yeah. and you try and please people. And what does that do? Well, that creates big problems. Mm in the long run. And so then what do you do? You go and hire a coach because you hate your job. And the truth is you don't hate your job. What you hate is running away from shame yeah. and the consequences of that. So he was able to fall back in love with his job because he stopped running away from shame, faced it dead in the eyes, looked at it like that wicked witch of the West and realized that all he had to do was throw a glass of water over it and she'd melt away. And, uh, and so not only that, though, has he kind of come to that place with his, his work, he's also exploring a whole different side to himself that he is very definitely very talented with, but it's not this sudden big shift and he's not a penniless actor now pushing his shopping cart with his worldly goods in it. You know, he's, he's found a way to, to morph himself bit by bit. I love that you managed to get a Wizard of Oz reference into a, <laughs> Well, this is LGBT the land of Dorothy, you know, that's, yeah. that's the way it is. We wouldn't be at home without it, so. Now, I'm conscientious that we are running out of time, so, uh, because I feel like there's so much more that we could cover, 
uh, in this book. I mean, we really have just um, touched the surface here. Yeah. Um, we will pop links uh, into the um, the website, Release Hypnosis website, and on YouTube so that people can find this book. Uh, but if people want to get in touch with you, Matt, uh, either for your coaching or for the uh, Velvet Rage study groups, how can they get in touch with you? So probably the best way is just to go to my website, which is matthewcooksey.com. So it's M-A-T-T-H-E-W cooksey.com. Um, hopefully you can post the link to it. And there's a, yeah. there's a tab on the website that just says Velvet. And if you're interested in joining one of these study groups, they're usually eight people or so. Um, and we meet virtually. It's not a in-person thing. Um, but we actually meet as a group and it was quite amazing. We actually, uh, had the first group meet in person after 12 weeks of studying the Velvet Rage online. So they had formed these incredibly deep connections with each other and yet they'd actually never met never before. Met. And yeah. so we all met at the end of the program. And, uh, I mean, it was just, it was just so moving to see these, these gay men who had formed these powerful bonds and um, that I think will last potentially a lifetime. So, um, so on the website, basically, if you click the velvet tab, um, there, you can register your interest. I run three of these a year usually. Um, and there's probably going to be one starting, uh, within the next six to eight weeks. So, um, you can register your interest there. And what's the criteria for anyone wanting to join? Um, so it's really designed for people who are who have read the book number one they need to have actually bought a copy of the book and read it already before they join the group um and then the second thing is that they've read it and they've they've um really resonated with stages two and three um that is really who this program is targeted for and i'm looking at creating uh, other programs for people who find themselves at stage one but right now at uh, the center of the program so that we have a cohort of people who are sort of in a similar spot mm. um is in that stages two wanting to get to three kind of thing so um but they can just everyone can just register their details there and if um what i do is i'll send a um a short application form that people can fill out and um and if it's not a, if it's not a good fit i will always refer that person on to somebody else or somewhere else so that they can get some support so and certainly, if we haven't inspired people to actually go out and buy a copy of the book and, and read it, uh, hopefully this podcast has helped give a bit of a snapshot that they've been able to resonate with and yeah. and to perhaps hear themselves in amongst the discussions that we've had today as well. Yeah. I know that um, hares and hyenas have copies of The Velvet Rage usually, so that will be a good place if you want to get your hands on it right away. But otherwise, you know, Amazon, Booktopia. Book Depository, like I think, have it for under yeah. $20. Uh, yeah. And, of course, you can get the... On Amazon, you can get the Kindle version for, I think, about $10. Yeah. So it's pretty good value. Cool. Matt, thank you so much for joining us Welcome. today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, you, you definitely got a wonderful way of words, uh, very engaging to listen to. Uh, if anyone has any questions for Matt uh, that they would like to send through us, please feel free to send them in. We'll, we'll pass them on to Matt. Otherwise, thank you for listening, and we look forward to you joining us in the next fortnight for the next Outthink. Take care.